started. Welcome to everyone. Vibas is in the back. Congratulations, Vibas, with the good rankings that we achieved this past year. And uh, I want to mention to you that uh, we do that for a number of years, that is, we sponsor this event. I want to apologize for the mess that you experience on campus, and the reason for that is because we are building and building and building the infrastructure of the ball. Next year, at the end of the summer, we're going to be opening a new academic building for the Le College of Business and I hope I will have the opportunity or all of you will have the opportunity to visit us as we want to use it as a vehicle to support the business community and organizations like GIC. With this, I should not say any more other than to mention to you that uh, GIC really uh, has uh, one important event every year and it's not only the conference that we hold here 
campus at Drexel, but also we all we have the 2012 Global Citizen Award recognition, and uh, this year will take place in October 19, uh, 2012. And I want you to participate. Please let me know how many of you you can sponsor this event because we have two outstanding citizens that we want to recognize. One of them is Bill Dangelberg. I'm not going to say too many good things about you. And Sam Jan. So ho hopefully we we'll have a, a very nice participation and as this has been a tradition for GIC to celebrate the accomplishments of uh, those leaders that impacted the growth of this organization that they have in international global uh, perspective. With this, I wish you uh, a great conference for today and thank you for joining us. Good morning, uh, welcome. Uh, my name is Paul Jensen, one of the Associate Deans uh, in the College of Business. Uh, thrilled to be here this morning. I'll be serving as moderator for our first session on demographics and economic growth. Uh, we have a couple of wonderful speakers lined up. Um, our first speaker, uh, Jack Goldstone. Uh, Jack is the Hazel Professor of Public Policy uh, and a fellow of the Mercatus Center at uh, George Mason University a non-resident senior fellow at the Brookings Institution. He has won major prizes for the American Sociological Association uh, and the Historical Society um, for his research on revolution and social change, and has won grants from the MacArthur Foundation, the U.S. Institute of Peace, and the National Science Foundation. Jack's current research focuses on conditions for building democracy and stability in developing nations, the impact of population change on the global economy and international security, and the cultural origins of modern economic growth. Jack, we're thrilled to have you. Looking forward to your remarks. Thanks so much, Bill, for inviting me. Thanks, everyone, here for coming today to the GIC. Um, I could throw a lot of numbers at you, but you can find numbers everywhere these days. I think the important thing is to understand what do the numbers of population change mean for political and economic change. Now, both Richard Sincata and I were part of a group that put together this volume, Political Demography, How Political Changes Are Reshaping International Security and National Politics. And I'm going to give you a bit of a teaser of what's in there. If you want to get the numbers and graphs and tables, uh, I hope you'll go ahead and get the volume on Amazon, or if you write me, I can get you a discount flyer and make it a little bit easier. Uh, but it's out in paperback, and it uh, covers all the material. I'm going to go over it more. Now, we're living in a world where it's hard to understand anything unless we put it in human terms and in stories, because the numbers are so overwhelming. I'm going to salt my talk with numbers, too. Those of you who are numbers junkies won't be disappointed. But my goal is to give you a better understanding of what is the role of population factors in economic growth and how are those factors stacking up in different parts of the world today and for the next few decades. Because I really think that more than at any time in recent history, population change is going to shape the global order of the 21st century. There are just so many changes underway, as I'll lay out for you, that we just haven't seen anything like it before. <coughs> Usually when people focus on population, they ask, how big? How big is a country? What are the numbers? What are they doing? But that's really not the essence of the story of economic growth. Uh, it's just a, a bottom line number. You kind of have to break down what's happening in a population to know what the implications are for the economy. So what are the components of population change that make economic growth go forward? Well, the first and probably the biggest is family formation. When people come together, form a family, have kids, they generally buy houses or they move up to larger apartments, they get furniture, they start saving for the kids' education, uh, they start thinking in terms of buying major appliances. So family formation has always been a big driver of consumer spending and of residential investment. And we saw the results of that in the baby boom and then again with the echo of the baby boom in the 1990s. Uh, the reverse of that is what's happened in Japan, where we've seen 
pretty much a uh, decline in any increase in family formation. And <coughs> residential property markets, as you probably know, have basically plummeted and been flat for 20 years. So family formation, picture young people getting together, starting families, that's one mode of growth. The second is innovation. But innovation also has a demographic characteristic, and that is most, not all, but most innovations do come from younger people, people who aren't bound by prior habits, prior ways of thinking, or a sense of their own limits. And so young people, particularly people um, in their 20s and 30s, have been the drivers of innovation. But also it requires these days for young people to have an education, because so many of the innovations come in areas such as neuroscience, uh, biology, uh, nanoengineering, uh, new fields that require education. So think of lots of young adults streaming into good high schools and colleges and coming out or even before they come out, uh, brimming with new ideas and looking for capital to support them. Again, we are living off the capital of the baby boomers to a large degree. Uh, even people like Bill Gates uh, we're the baby boomers, part of that new generation of young people who want to change things. And we went through a wonderful period of post-footnic investment in our young people. And they are still contributing and keeping us moving forward. Uh, but we need a new generation of young people to keep that going. The other side of youth is youth tend to be early adopters of new technologies and new lifestyles. Older people, people like me, tend to be more conservative in our taste. We hang on to our cars. We don't uh, turn in our appliances. I'm even working here in front of you with a three-year-old laptop, unheard of. Uh, but it's true that people who are in their 40s, and especially 50s, 60s, and 70s, tend to be more conservative and less likely to change their lifestyle or their spending habits or to be among the first to acquire new technologies. A fourth factor driving economic growth is urbanization. Urbanization has two wonderful qualities. In developing countries, urbanization greatly boosts the productivity of people because manufacturing and service jobs, which are concentrated in cities, tend to have much higher productivity than agricultural work in the countryside. So a big part of China's economic growth, for example, in the last 20 years, was its increase from 20, about 20 to 23 percent urbanized uh, in the early 1980s to over 50% urbanization today. Um, urbanization also has a cluster effect, bringing people together, exposing them to different ideas, creating new collaborations, cross-fertilization. Cities also tend to be the hubs of creativity. My former colleague, Richard Florida, has written a lot about this, trying to analyze what makes cities more creative. And basically, it's a more diverse, open uh, structure that allows people to come in form networks, and develop their ideas and find support. Finally, the fifth major factor boosting growth is immigration. Immigration of two kinds. Uh, high skill immigrants create great opportunities for growth. They amplify the skills of the existing population. Uh, we've heard, again, our Sergi friend, founder of Google, came in as an immigrant. Of course, the United States built on immigrants, fortunately remained open to immigration, and acquired a large number of Asian, particularly Asian, Latin American, African entrepreneurs who have started businesses and thrive in this country. But it's also helpful to have some low-skill immigration, because low-skill immigration provides a reservoir of labor for growth, also provides low-wage labor at a time when populations often are not willing to do some of the entry-level and heavy manual work that complex economies still require. So a lot of the uh, construction and agricultural work in this country has been done by immigrants from Mexico and other countries, El Salvador in particular, where I am in DC. And that also has been a booster for growth. So let me draw for you now a picture of demography in a country that has all the motors for economic growth running. There are a lot of young people starting to form families, build their careers, look toward the future. There are a lot of young adults getting education and preparing to be innovators and entrepreneurs. There are a lot of young people who are anxious to be early adopters of new technology and push the limits on what their lifestyles can do. There is a surge in urbanization where cities are creating thriving centers of new ideas, new enterprises. 
And there are open doors to immigration so that the economy can absorb people with skills and ideas and people with labor in order to create an efficient match between the labor needs of the economy and the labor of the population. All that's good. Unfortunately, it's all going away if not already gone in most of the rich countries of the world. And when I say that, it sounds like hyperbole, but the changes are indeed dramatic and arresting and I think not at all appreciated. In Europe and Japan, as you probably know, uh, population growth has stalled and in some cases started to stop, particularly among those of working age. Baby boomers are still hanging on, so the population hasn't started to decline, but the population aged 15 to 50, kind of the prime working age population, that is already shrinking. Worse yet, young adults in the population are not getting a job because those who have them are hanging on for dear life, and rigid labor markets are preventing companies from hiring new people on attractive contracts. So we're not seeing much family formation. Uh, youngsters in Italy, Portugal, and Greece are still living with their parents. They're hesitant to form new families. Innovation, uh, still the lifeblood of developed economies, is facing a challenge as the number of college-age students stagnates and starts to decline, particularly with controversy over access to college the degree to which students who come to this country or others from abroad study in college, what do we do? <coughs> Often, if they're not citizens, we kick them out. At a time when we really desperately need to reinforce our ranks of skilled young people, uh, we are not making it easy for skilled people to come and settle and contribute long-term to the economy. Urbanization, the rich countries have already pretty much maxed out on their rate of urbanization. Now the problem is keeping cities healthy. Uh, places like Detroit are a warning to what can happen when finances and manufacturing go south. And of course, immigration remains a controversy. We take it for granted in this country that one of our strengths is immigration, and the question is going to be, well, how much? Do we tweak immigration? Do we push it back a little bit? But the rug is being pulled out from under us. The USA Today, this morning, under my door in the hotel, reported that last year, they estimate the number of Americans who returned from the US to Mexico was as large as the number of Mexicans who came here. That is, net migration from Mexico seems to have zeroed out. Now that will be important when I get to some of the other issues that arise with an aging population and dealing with finances. America has looked better than Europe to many demographers because America is supposedly more open immigration and has higher fertility due to the large number of immigrants that still have larger families. But those trends are slipping away quickly. Another headline in USA Today last week, not that USA Today is always my first choice of source material, <laughs> but they're being very good about giving attention to demography lately. Uh, they reported that the rate of teenage births in the USA hit an all-time low. And that is surprising and ominous because people's fertility behavior tends to be determined fairly young. Teens who have children tend to have further children in their 20s, whereas people who put off childbearing for whatever reasons tend to have fewer total children. So if the teen birth rate dropped to an all-time low, that suggests that overall birth rates will be declining in the future, and the so-called high American birth rate rates will be going down to European levels. And for that matter, um, migrant birth rates have also been going down faster than expected. So we may, in the United States, not have that supposed cushion we have of, yes, we have all the immigrants we want, we have better demography than Europe, uh, we can't count on that for the future. So family formation, you know, has been hurt by the housing market decline as well. Uh, innovation has relied in the last 20 years on a large number, frankly, of uh, South Asian students coming to our engineering and science departments and getting PhDs and keeping that knowledge in this country. Um, and the urbanization. Fortunately, we've had a wonderful revival of cities like Philadelphia, New York, Cleveland, Pittsburgh. They've reinvented themselves to some degree as intellectual, medical, financial design centers from the old manufacturing basis, and that's good. But the next stage remains to be played out. We haven't reinvented as many Silicon Valleys as we'd like to see. But we need to be looking toward keeping <coughs> cities healthy to attract the entrepreneurs and engineers who will put together the next generation of technology. Now, what are the components that make growth cease? What do we look at in a population that is not doing well? 
For one, long-term youth unemployment. Long-term youth unemployment is a real hazard for countries because when you think of pop, when you think of societies, not just as collections of people, but as living populations, what a society does when it reproduces itself over time is it basically moves people through the life course from childhood, teenage, young adult, mature life. And for people to move through that life course productively, they should be getting educational support as kids, job market experience, and entry in their 20s, so that by the time they hit their 30s, they have work experience, discipline, and the tools to be maximally productive. Youth who do not get jobs in their early 20s tend to have problems throughout their entire lifetime in adjusting to the job market. They tend to be more in and out of work. They tend to be less hireable because they don't have the resume that they started, that they should have started when they were young. And they don't have the team building skills, the discipline, and the flexibility they need to proceed later in life. So if you have a large number of young people that are out of work for three years, five years, they tend to permanently slip in what could be their productivity course. And that's what we're seeing all across Europe and even the United States. Youth unemployment is way too high. That's partly, of course, because the economy is suffering from recession, but also partly because, frankly, with interest rates 1% or 2%, who can afford to retire? So people are hanging on to jobs and not creating opportunities for young folks. And again, if we don't have that family formation, if we don't have that overall growth, if we don't have that demand for 2 or 3% growth in the economy, firms are not going to hire. So we're stuck now in a dangerous cycle of low growth, low hiring, and high youth unemployment. And by we, I really mean the entire developed world. High dependency ratios are another problem for economies that want to grow. By dependency ratio, I simply mean the ratio between those who are of working age, now usually 20 to 60, and those who are either too old or too young to be full-time workers. So those who are retired, and I'm 60 is the nominal retirement age in much of Europe now, 65 here, and young people, say, under 20. Um, the baby boom, as it started, created some high dependency rates because we had a lot of young kids. But the US was also the dominant economy in the world, and we could afford to invest in our kids by building lots of schools, uh, creating the facilities the kids need. And the good thing about high dependency ratio with a lot of kids is when you spend money on children, to feed them, to clothe them, to educate them, to house them, to give them travel opportunities, that's an investment for the future. A child who is brought up to be a productive member of society starts paying that back for 20, 40 years as they go through their adult life. On the other hand, what do you do with baby boomers that are aging and are looking at consuming resources once they hit 65 and living probably now to 85. Uh, life expectancy in this country has reached high 70s, low 80s, but there's no reason that life expectancy should just stop growing. Life expectancy has been growing steadily by a year a decade for the entire century, and with medical advances, improvements in everything from growing and even printing organs uh, to better preventive care, there's no reason not to expect life expectancy to be up into, well, well up into the 80s, perhaps even into the 90s. Uh, many of you who are older remember the days when it was a rare thing for someone to live to be 100. You got a letter from the Queen of England if you were a British citizen and lived to be 100. You got a mention on the morning news if you were uh, a centenarian in this country. But it's now routine. People live to be 100, it's no big deal. Uh, but if they retire at 60, 65, it's 35 to 40 years of retirement. And all of the resources that they consume for leisure, for travel, for health care, you can't do that as an investment. Because when they die, those funds are buried with them. You don't get a payback out of their productive adult life. So there's a big issue in dependency ratio if you shift from a dependency ratio with a lot of young people to a dependency ratio with a lot of older ones. Now the sweet spot is to be in the middle. A great thing for growth is if you have a population with a lot of people in their prime working years, and not too many old and not too many young. And that's where a lot of developing countries are right now. That's one reason they're doing so well. Come back to that But the high dependency ratios and the high aging is where Europe, Japan, and the US are headed. Finally, a big problem in 
poorer countries is rapid population growth without commensurate growth in services, education, and economic opportunity. There's nothing wrong with rapid population growth if you have plenty of capital and plenty of jobs and plenty of opportunities to put people to work. China had booming economic growth in the 80s and 90s, and they put those people to work to form the workshop of the world because they were low cost, reasonably well trained and literate workers, and they were hired in bunches. And China did very well out of its population growth. Even so, China got scared. Chinese worried that we need to capitalize on our population growth by focusing on this generation, meaning the generation of the 80s and 90s. So they implemented a one child policy that would limit growth to what they felt would be manageable levels and let them focus on the growth of the labor force rather than generating an extra half billion children. So they did that, and the consequences are now coming home to roost. They're actually running out of workers because they had too few children. Now, I'll come back to that in a moment. But the contrast between a country like China, which we think of as a demographic behemoth, and say, oh yeah, China, huge, billion, 1.4 billion people, no end in sight. Well, actually, the end is already in sight. The Economist magazine, in fact, wrote uh, an article this week about China's Achilles heel being its demography. Uh, in fact, China is on course, if there are no major changes, for the population to decline by 450 million by the end of this century. The population of China is set to peak in around 10 or 15 years, and then start a slow decline that will accelerate after the century. Now that's a striking change. On the other hand, you've got the countries in Sub-Saharan Africa where growth is actually picking up speed because the improvements in child health and child mortality are offsetting the declines in birth rates. So countries like Nigeria and Tanzania, the net reproduction rate, that is the number of surviving children per parent, has actually been going up in recent years. So, components that make growth cease. Long-term youth unemployment, high dependency ratios, especially with the aging, or such rapid population growth that you cannot provide the infrastructure to give those children education and economic opportunity to make them productive. And finally, a closed and monoculture society has always been fatal for growth. One of the things I work on is really long-term economic growth since the 16th and 17th century. And it's quite striking. Wherever you look in the world, empires had their height, whether it was the Ottoman Empire, or the Chinese Empire, or the Mughal Empire, or even Victorian Britain. They had their height of creativity and economic prowess when they were most open to the world in terms of trade and importing people, products, and ideas. And when they started to get conservative and close up and religiously orthodox and hostile to foreigners, their trade, their innovation, their technological leadership all started to decline. So a closed and monoculture society is another demographic marker of growth. It's really distressing to me as I look around the world that in the 1980s and 1990s, we had a lot of societies around the world where the components of population growth were really positive for growth. You had lots of family formation in Europe and the US, and especially China, India, Lots of young adults getting college education more than ever. Uh, urbanization, immigration, all of that was moving forward. But if you look around the world today, all of a sudden, in the last five years, these trends seem to have slowed or reversed. Uh, in most of the rich countries, aging has just accelerated to a remarkable degree. Um, here's some of the projections. Let's look about where, where these changes are happening in the world. In Germany, which is thriving today, 23% of the population is over 60. That's a lot. If Germany's economy weren't booming by exporting Mercedes and BMWs to China, Germany would be in the same difficult position as Italy of supporting a very large aging population with a low worker base. But Germany has kept the productivity of its workers high, its economy competitive, and so foreign profits are enriching Germany and allowing it to meet its <coughs> demands. However, in, 30, in about 40 years, at current rates of change, Germany's over 60 population will be 40% of the entire population. One out of every two adults over 20 will be 60 years old or older. Now, we have no idea what it's like to live in a society like that. Humanity has never, ever seen it. We've never seen anything like that. 
I mean, you can just, if you've ever been caught on the road behind an older driver <laughs> navigating their way slowly, you know, we're, we're heading for a world in Europe, which fortunately isn't as reliant on cars as we are, where, you know, one out of every three drivers will be 75 or older. One out of every two will be 60 or older. It won't be that bad in America. We're going to be looking about one out of four. But still, this is a change. It's a change in the facilities that countries need to cope with an aging population. And it's a huge vacuum that will be left for drivers of growth. Uh, Asia, Japan, and Korea the same. Japan and South Korea will both be about 40% over 60 uh, by 2050. And China, within just 30 years, is going to be older on average than the United States. So because of that one child policy, uh, China's labor force is aging very quickly. People are sometimes worried about China's pension. They have none. And they say China's going to be the first country in the world to get old before it got rich. To me, that's not so bad because in rich countries, old people are greedy. They want lots and lots of support. They want medical care. They want pensions. They want to have nice retirements. Frankly, old people in China, remembering what they went through in the Cultural Revolution, a lot of them are grateful just to have a safe place to live, a stable diet, comfortable income. They don't expect to live royally the way American and European baby boomers do. But what worries me about aging in China is China is also going to be the first country to get old before it gets innovative. Because innovation needs intellectual and political freedom to thrive. And China, although moving slowly to open up its political system is still holding the brakes on tight. China still doesn't allow the open exchange of ideas, the free creativity, the free exchange of competition that European and American countries do. China wants to become an innovation economy. It knows that's the next step for its economic growth. It, it can't rely on low wage labor anymore because that's drying up. It can't rely just on uh, breakneck break urbanization because it's already the majority of urban country. So the growth in China has got to come from innovation, but they are losing their young people before they're opening up their intellectual planet. So they're going to be saddled with a primary working generation in its 30s, 40s, and 50s that grew up in a very intellectually restrictive climate and who are not accustomed to being adventurous or innovative with their ideas because that is dangerous. So China's opportunities to become and train a generation of innovators is, is rapidly slipping away. Now the US, as I've said, is often used in a favorable demographic situation because whereas European societies have fertility rates, um, the number of children per women of about 1.5 or even less, in Shanghai, it's only about 0.6. People in Shanghai, kids are luxury, can't afford it, housing's expensive, cars are fun, so 0.6, unbelievable. Um, but uh, Europe, 1.5, some places 1.2. America, fertility rate is still about 2. But as I've said, that may be an artifact of having had very high immigration and of fertility rates being high, brought higher. But fertility rates in Mexico are already going down. So there are fewer young people in Mexico, and when they come here, they tend to adopt our fertility behavior quickly. So we may lose that. Still, we look better, but the problem for America is we spend twice as much of our GDP on health care as any other rich country. Older people are prime consumers of health care and will be heavier consumers of health care in the future. And so what do we do as the country with the highest health costs in the world who also is going to have the largest increase in our elderly population? And the good news in America is because people are having kids, we're only going to have like one out of four people over 60 instead of one out of two and a half like in Europe. But because our baby boom was so large, the absolute number of old people in this country, old like, you know, I'm going to be 60 in a few years, so don't take it personally. But the number of seniors, this is what I call the senior surge, we're looking at a 137% increase in the number of Americans over 60 by mid-century. Most European countries are looking at a 50 to 60% increase. We're looking at twice as large a surge. And if we're also paying twice as large a uh, medical cost for their care, we're going to be in trouble. Now, it's not all bad news. I point to what I call the Timbi nations, Turkey, India, Mexico, Brazil, Indonesia, as examples of successful developing countries. When I say successful, they are in that 
demographic sweet spot. They have lowered their fertility. Believe it or not, India is heading toward the lower place of fertility. It will be there in a decade or so. Uh, population will still grow because it has so many young women who are still in childbearing years, but their population growth will soon level out, and their dependency ratio is very low. They're going through the same sweet spot that China went through. Same is true in Brazil, Turkey, Mexico. Their fertility is under control. They don't yet have a lot of old people. They have a lot of young people in college. Turkey has more students, it has 18 million students in college, in school now, uh, K through 12 and higher education. 18 million students, that's more than the total population of half the countries in the EU. So Turkey, I think, is going to be a powerhouse. The same can be true of Brazil. <coughs> Russia, on the other hand, demographic disaster. China shrinking, so I think the BRICS is an outmoded concept. The emerging countries of the world that have got their fertility under control, that are improving their productivity, they are going to be the economic motors of the future. That's where the future middle class, the future trends of consumption, the trends of art and music, that's where we're going to That's the good news. The worry is there are a lot of countries that are in desperate condition because their fertility rates are still remarkably high. Countries like Pakistan, Iraq, Afghanistan, Yemen, much of Sub-Saharan Africa, parts of Central America, still have growth rates of 2% or more a year. So a country like Afghanistan, which has been a headache for the world, 25 million people, is going to have 50 million people by 2040. Uh, the projections on Sub-Saharan Africa by the United Nations that were made just last year are truly frightening. Uh, don't know if they'll hold up, but they've noted this trend that in Africa, Growth rates are ticking up now because fertility has stopped falling, but healthcare measures are promoting the survival of young children. So they project a country like Nigeria, which today is about 150 million people, the largest, the largest country in Africa. But their projection is that on current course, Nigeria will have almost 400 million people by 2050. That Nigeria will be almost as large as the United States. And if it continues unchecked, they project, and this may be fiction, but it's addressed in the UN books as fact, is a projection that on median course, that assuming some fertility decline, Nigeria is on track to have 780 million people by 2100. Now, of course, what we often hear is that the way to avoid this hollowing out of the middle class is to make sure that people have much better <coughs> educations. So instead of having people who assemble robots, we want to have people who can design robots. Well, unfortunately, we also know that the quality of America's education system remains, at least compared to other OECD countries, rather subpar. You can see from this chart, these are OECD PISA scores. This is a standardized set of exams administered in many countries around the world. And if you look at the average score in math, reading, and science, the US ends up being in the bottom half of the distribution. This despite the fact that per pupil, the US spends much more than any major economy. And indeed, in real terms, the US spends about 50% more per student now than it did in the early 1980s. Now, this is a chart that you may have seen. Let me show you a chart that you may not have seen. This is basically the same chart as before. But what I've done here, is I've broken down the US bar into people, students of various ethnic groups. And I think this chart is important in many respects. If you look at US Asian students, so these are K-12 students, Asian students who live and study in the US. So if the US education system is failing kids, Apparently, Asians never quite got the message because they're actually doing extremely well, right? In fact, US Asian students in general do better than Asian students in Asia, right? That's something worth thinking about. However, look at the other side of the chart. You can see that Hispanic students and African American students do rather poorly. Now, that's important. Clearly, this is a major social issue. However, I think it's also a very important economic issue as well. And the reason for this is illustrated on this chart. 
You can see that based on census projections. Over the next 40 years, non-Asian minority students, African Americans, and Hispanics, will account for more than 100% of the growth of the U.S. labor force. All of the growth of the U.S. labor force will come from demographic groups that have historically done relatively poorly in terms of educational outcomes. This isn't just a social issue. In my mind, this is a very important economic issue. Indeed, I think this is a much more important economic issue than what happens with marginal tax rates or whether the Fed does Q3. This is something that's going to impact the U.S. for decades to come. Unfortunately, if you look at test scores by ethnicity over the last three decades, overall test scores have remained largely flat. And the educational gaps between ethnic groups have also remained broadly unchanged. This is a very, very serious problem. Now, I don't want to be completely pessimistic. I think there's a lot of good evidence to suggest that if you give parents more choice as to where they send their kids to school, if you give schools more independence, you tend to get better results. Certainly, parental satisfaction goes up, dropout rates go down, and to some extent, I think the evidence suggests that test scores also go up. We also know that Mexican students do much worse in Mexico than Mexican students who come over here and get their education in the US. So the quality of education matters. That's important. And we need to do a lot more to improve the quality of educational outcomes for a lot of our students. Now, Hispanics are going to play a very important role in the growth of the US labor force. As you saw from this chart, based on census projections, the number of Hispanics in the labor force is going to increase by 43 million between now and 2050. So it's worth talking a little bit about Hispanics. And here it's a bit of a good news, bad news story. The good news is that Hispanics made significant gains between the first generation and the second generation. You can see that for first generation, Hispanics' college completion rates are very low. They increase significantly between the first and second generation. That's very good news. The bad news is that for a third generation, they hire Hispanics. So these are just people in the US who identify as Hispanics who have been here for three generations or more. Their college completion rate still remains only one half that of non Hispanic. Now, obviously, there's a lot of variation within the Hispanic community as there is within any ethnic group. Uh, but the bottom line is that as a group, on average, Hispanics aren't doing as well as the broader population. And given that they're going to represent the bulk of the population growth, that's something that's going to have an impact on inequality, and it's going to have an impact on productivity going forward. Okay, I've talked about the economic implications. Let me talk a little bit about the political implications. So with this chart, perhaps this is about politics, perhaps it's not about politics, I'll let you decide. But let me sort of make this case. There's a myth out there that's widely perpetuated, which is false, that most government transfers go to poor people. In fact, that's false. Most government transfers go to old people. You can see from this chart here that in the early 1980s, 20% of federal government transfers went to households with children. That number has actually been steadily falling over the last three decades. In contrast, the share of federal transfers going to elderly households, where children have left the home, is very high and is rising. And it's going to continue to rise. It's going to continue to rise for all the reasons that Jack discussed. Population is getting older. Here's a chart 
of the projected increase in the population of people age 65 and older. It's going to increase based on current trends from around 21% with a share of those between the ages of 20 to 64, all the way up to 34% in about two decades. That's a huge increase, unprecedented. What does that mean for government finances? Well, it means that a lot more money will need to be spent on Medicare, healthcare for the older, older population, and on Social Security. And you can see from this chart here that based on Congressional Budget Office projections, spending on Medicare is going to go up by 2.2 percentage points of GDP, huge increase. Spending on Social Security will go up by 1.6 percent. Spending on Medicaid, which primarily benefits poor people, is also going to go up as healthcare costs rise, but it's going to go up at a more modest pace, increasing by 1.3 percent of GDP. Most of the increase in government transfers that are projected to occur over the next few decades will go to the old. Now I said that the earlier chart was perhaps about politics, perhaps not about politics. In some sense, I think it's very much about politics. It's basically what we're going to have over the next couple of decades is a population that's aging. Older people in the US generally tend to be whiter than those who are younger. If you look at the breakdown of uh, age and ethnicity. In a state like Texas, the median Hispanic is 19 years old. The median non-Hispanic white is 40 years old. So basically, we're going to end up in a situation where people from ethnic minority groups are going to be asked to pay higher taxes to support an older, whiter population group. That is the recipe for ethnic Tension. It's a recipe for all sorts of divisive politics that this country has never seen. That's something that we see. You can see that something will have to emerge. This is, again, data from the Congressional Budget Office suggesting that current trends, the budget debt, government debt, is going to explode. Obviously, it will never get up to 180%. The Treasury market will ride before it happens. So tough choices will have to be made. And it's going to be a very difficult and very acrimonious political environment, I fear, in which these choices are going to be made. Let's talk about a little bit about how people vote. Because obviously, the political choices that are made over the next couple of decades will depend on which of the two major political parties has more influence. Well, this is a chart that, in many respects, suggests that the Republican Party is in a lot of trouble. As I said before, Hispanics are a growing share of the population. Hispanics historically have voted two for one over Democrats. You can see from that chart here that this is something that's been ongoing for around 30 years, basically from as far as the data begins. Very worried development for the Republicans. This is my estimate on the number of votes that will be cast in federal elections based on ethnicity. And again, you can see that the share of votes cast by non Hispanic whites is going to decline from the high 70s below 16% by the middle of the century, while the number of votes cast by Hispanics and other minority groups is going to increase significantly. What I've done in this chart is very simple. I've simply assumed that historic voting patterns by age cohort and ethnic cohort stay exactly the same. And then I've projected what will happen to votes cast for Republicans and Democrats Assuming that people within a particular ethnic group and a particular age within that ethnic group continue to vote in the same way that they have over the last decade or so. 
And what you can see from this chart, if you make that extrapolation, obviously these sort of extrapolations have to be taken with a big grain of salt, but if you make that extrapolation, Democrats are going to benefit from an almost 10 point swing in their favor over the next 40 years. Now you can say, well, this is all hypothetical, maybe it'll happen, maybe it won't. And I would say that it's not hypothetical. That in fact, it's already happened. If you look at this chart here, these are election results by electoral district in Texas. Texas historically, solid Republican state. You can see that it's slowly turning Democratic. All those districts in the South are primarily Hispanic districts. They're overwhelmingly voting for Democrats. If Texas goes the same way as California, the Republican Party will cease to be a major national party. It's as simple as that. Okay. If you're a Republican, what should you be doing to prevent that from happening? Well, clearly one of the arguments out there is that Republicans should be doing a better job of appealing to Hispanics in particular, perhaps easing off the rhetoric about immigration. And the question is, is that a sensible strategy if you're a Republican strategist? Well, it may be, it may not be. I think it cuts both ways. On the one hand, you can certainly argue that promoting a more open immigration policy that leads to more immigrants from Latin America, basically you're just setting yourself up for failure. You're going to have even more Hispanics in the country in a couple of decades voting for the other party. That's hardly a recipe for success. On the other hand, you can sort of turn around and say, well, wait a second. If you ease up on the immigration rhetoric, more Hispanics will vote for you. If you also make it a little bit easier for people who are in this country legally to gain a path to citizenship, that will allow them to climb the income ladder as they become solidly middle class, the more likely to vote for the Republicans. I'm not going to wait on this issue, but I think it does cut both ways. It's not as simple and clear as many people like it to be. Now, how do Hispanic people actually think about this issue? Well, what's interesting, and I think this runs contrary to a lot of the dialogue that you hear, is that in fact, for a lot of Hispanics, the issue of immigration is not their primary focus. This is from the Pew Research Center. And you can see that based on opinion polls, for most Hispanics, the key issue is education, the key issue is jobs, healthcare. Immigration is important, but it's not as important as the other issues. Now this sort of begs the question, if immigration is the key issue for Hispanics, why are they voting for Democrats? Now I would say that the main reason is that on average, Hispanics are poor, and as a group, they tend to vote for Democrats because Democrats, in general, are more in favor of programs that will redistribute wealth towards them, programs that boost social transfer payments and the like. And you can see from this chart here just how stark the differences in wealth are across various ethnic groups. So when you're thinking about what's going to happen to inequality, keep this chart in mind. Hispanics needing household wealth is less than one tenth that of non Hispanic whites. Asians have seen a major decrease in household wealth. That's largely a story about the housing bust. Uh, most Asians in the US are concentrated on the coast of California, Florida, and New York, where there are significant declines in property prices. But the bottom line is that if you're worried about equality, if you're worried about social tensions, this is a chart that is worth thinking very hard about. Now, I don't think the reason his Hispanics vote for Democrats is entirely a function of the fact that on average they're poor. You can see from this chart here, this is the breakdown of the Hispanic vote in the 2010 Russian elections and how that varies across various demographic characteristics. If you look at household income, what's interesting is that the spread between Democratic and Republican voting Hispanics is just as large 
for poor Hispanics as it is for wealthier Hispanics. And that's interesting. The question is, why is that? Because a lot of Hispanics may actually have an economic incentive to vote for the Republicans. Well, I think part of the story is that because Hispanics, on average, are poorer than the national average, even wealthy Hispanics tend to sympathize with their own ethnic group and vote for Democrats. And you see the exact opposite amongst non-Hispanic whites. Non-Hispanic whites overwhelmingly supported McCain over Obama in the last election, even though you can make the case that if you are a white person out in Kentucky earning $30,000 a year, you have a stronger incentive to vote for Democrats. Now, to me, this is a very troubling development. What this tells me is that increasingly, American society, the American political system, is being fractured along ethnic lines. That's very, very troublesome. There's one thing that's very clear from history, is that countries where the voting depends a lot on the color of your skin or your religion, these sort of countries suffer a great deal of social stress. And unfortunately, I think there's some reason to think that the US is in the early stages of moving to that sort of a system. That needs to be stopped at all costs. Ethnopolitics is a cancer upon the body public. If left unchecked, it will grow and it will destroy and undermine democratic institutions. We see that in Iraq, we see that in Sri Lanka, we see that across Africa. I'm not saying that the US is gonna go entirely in that direction, but we are in the early stages of a move in that way. Let me sum up. I've made the case that inequality is worsening due to globalization, technological change. I think that will continue. Those forces are going to be very hard to stop. At the same time, given current democratic, the democratic trends, it's also likely that there might be some slowing in productivity growth unless we can do more to increase educational outcomes for our non-Asian minority students. Because as I said, they're going to represent not just a large chunk of the growth in the labor force, they're going to represent all of the growth in the labor force over the next 40 years. I've also mentioned the fact that increasingly American politics is being polarized by age, older people who want Medicare and Social Security, and younger people who are being asked to pay for it, as well as by ethnic considerations. That to me is extremely important. What can we do about it? Well, in my sense, I think the only solution, this is my view, is really the only solution that makes sense, is to adapt policies, political policies, economic policies, social policies, cultural policies, that really encourage people to think of themselves as Americans, rather as members of particular identity groups, whether it be a member of a certain religion or a member of a certain ethnic group. If we don't do that, then we might not just be talking about the end of the middle class, we might be talking about the end of the American democratic system as we know it. Thank you for the choice. Thank you. Um, we're a little bit behind, but we have time for some questions uh, from the audience. We have a microphone. I have uh, two questions for Peter. Two, we can talk about um, the inequality in income. There's also the issue about mobility within the income class. In 2006, the Treasury issued a report that said half the people who were in the top 1% were not there 10 years before. So the first question is, is there any, are there any changes in terms of mobility in the income class or more since then? Second question, two years ago in the Census Bureau issued its share of the it updated its projection for the U.S. The headline in the press was that in the year 2050, 49% of the U.S. population would be non Hispanic black. But what's buried in the report and never highlighted in, in the year 2050, 80% of the population would consider themselves a white. So I've got to answer your question about that. Well, 
Okay, so on the issue of uh, income mobility, uh, that report, I think, has been rightfully panned by many economists. The report was actually misleading in one critical respect. If you look at income mobility, there's a lot of mobility from the youth to the old, but a lot of that simply reflects the fact that college students don't earn a lot. If you look at mobility across generations, so if you look at how likely is it for a son to be wealthy as his father was wealthy, how likely is it for a son to be poor if his father was poor, the U.S. actually does very poorly in terms of income mobility. Indeed, there was a recent OECD report that I think made, made it very clear that there's less income mobility in the U.S. than there is in most than there are than there is in most European countries. So, unfortunately, it doesn't seem to me that the ability for people to simply move along the income ladder is enough to offset the fact that inequality is rising in the income distribution. Uh, on the issue of how people identify themselves, I think that's a critical issue. Uh, how will people think of themselves? Uh, my sense is that if we adopt policies that get people to think that of themselves as white or as Hispanic, white, just as Americans, a lot of these problems can be avoided. I hope we move in that direction, and as my kind of slide suggests, I think that's the only hope that we have. And that's really the best hope for the Republican Party, right? Um, so it's sort of to people of one group or another basically try to craft policies that appeal to a broad spectrum of Americans. That's the recipe for success. Um, it seems like um, we always focus on what's happening with big companies because they're so big and it has such a big economic impact. Is it, uh, is it just too far out to think about what happens after the baby boomers die? Because I think all these things reverse in 40 years. Is that just too far to, to think intelligently about it, or is it worthwhile to consider that you know, all the things that we are worrying about in the next 40 years are going to have the opposite problems after that? I don't think you can say that the problems will go away after 40 years. It's true that once the baby boomers die off, uh, you get rid of some of the overhead. But we're making this transition from societies in which we have kind of a broad age pyramid with a lot more young people than old to a stable age pyramid. Because if we have a stable population, we're in a situation where the number of people, say, aged uh, 20 to 40 is going to be the same as the number 40 to 60 or 60 to 80. So that ratio of workers to elderly is going to undergo kind of a permanent adjustment downward. The baby boom is a distortion that amplifies it and makes it even worse in the short term. But it's a permanent change unless we go back to the days of people like yourself having three or four children. Now, in addition, <laughs> in, in addition, the financial debts that we run up uh, taking care of baby boomers are probably inescapable. There's going to be a short-term issue, but unless we have long-term productivity growth, then the baby boomers will visit a bankruptcy or crisis on us that will have permanent effects. So in a sense, what Peter was saying about the need to educate the next generation of workers becomes <coughs> even more critical. In a sense, the loss of the baby boomers, yes, it ends this overhang, but it leaves us with a labor force that is even to a much larger extent younger, Hispanic, more diverse. And if they don't pick up the slack of productivity when the baby boomers depart from the scene, the consequences will be dire. Yes.
population can age, they can't become more creative later in life. And the working life seems to end at 65, and yet that was one year before my grandfather's death. Wouldn't it make sense, or is there something just naturally inherent in the demographic numbers that say people can't work beyond a certain age, or they can't be creative beyond a certain age? Is the aging more of a, a situation where I'm 80 and I can fall and break my hip, but since I get a hip replacement, I don't die next year, and then I wait for the next problem, which is my heart, and then I get a new valve, and then I go on into my 90s, so we're extending life too long. You, you understand what I mean? Yeah. Um, the point you make is an excellent one, and the way I approach this is I say we need to find ways to continue to gain productivity and contributions out of the population, particularly 65 to 85. I think people, most people will want to have some years of retirement, say 85 to 100, but that 65 to 85 is now becoming a period in life when people still have pretty much all the vitality and energy uh, and potential uh, contribution to economic output that they used to have between 45 and 65. In that sense, things are changing. But right now, we don't have the uh, work system in place to make use of that. There are another two things. First of all, we have this funny idea about retirement that you work full time until the day before you retire, and then you become superfluous or 100% retirement. That's kind of crazy. It seems to me we should be moving toward a system where, say, after 65, people can opt to reduce their hours and have a little more leisure. That's part of the reward for a long working life. But instead of either you work full time or you're out, you should be able to opt for three quarters, half time, one quarter, and kind of slowly phase the contribution as you go from 65 to 85, depending on what line of work you're in. So, and obviously, frontline police will want to move to desk jobs and things like that. But for a lot of people, you can keep working. Second, it's true that people who are older are less creative. Um, that's true just in a variety of enterprises, but there are other areas where judgment and wisdom outweigh that. In medicine, for example, you get the best efforts by having teams with some young hotshots out of medical school, but you also want surgeons who have practiced hundreds of thousands of operations to be part of your teams. There are a lot of people who have management skills and experience that's becoming superfluous in the developed world, but those skills are in great demand in developing countries. So there's room for whole cadres of educators, managers, technical experts. If they're willing to move abroad and can find safe environments and conducive environments, there are exciting challenges in shifting and working. Now, a lot of people say, well, you want to stay close to home, but you can stay close to your family through Skype and internet now to ease your degree. And you know, people, frankly, for their leisure, they're choosing to go abroad and, and experience the adventure. So I think we need to think in terms of uh, development core and facilitating efforts to make use of professional skills where they're going to be most productive and most in, in demand, which may be abroad. But we don't, we, you can't even, you know, your Medicare uh, benefits are not portable now. If you go abroad, you have to. Manage. So I think there are a lot of things we can do to change the experience of those 65 to 85 years and make them more productive globally and locally. If I could just add, add a few words. Uh, if you look at the long-term fiscal trends in the U.S., almost all of the problem stems from runaway spending and healthcare programs. Social Security is part of it, but it's a relatively small part. But the interesting thing is if you look at what's driving healthcare spending and why it's increasing as a share of the economy, most of that is just simply due to the fact that the menu of healthcare options that people can avail themselves of just keeps on increasing, increasing, and increasing. That's actually a good thing, right? It means that people are getting better healthcare, that diseases that before were difficult to treat now can be treated. Uh, having lived in the U.S. for 10 years now, living back home in Canada, I wouldn't wish the Quebec healthcare system for my worst enemy. We don't pay a lot for healthcare. It's absolutely awful. In the U.S., if you have health care, if you have medical insurance, the quality of the health care that you get here is just second to none. It's very, very good. So you get what you pay for. But the problem is that increasingly we've created a political system that says that once you insure in 65, it's no longer your obligation to pay for health care. It's a taxpayer's obligation. And that, unfortunately, is going to have to have to shift. And you know, whether we like it or not, I think that the equivalent of Sarah Palin's death panels 
are going to be, become part of the reality. Choices will have to be made. Government bureaucrats will decide, okay, if you want Medicare, Medicaid, some procedures will be covered, others won't. If you want treatment, get, get insurance. I think invariably that's going to be what happens. I just took it from your presentation that the wealth transfer that we're talking about if, uh, for the elderly is getting bigger, they have the population, the voting population are also getting bigger. So the money's traveling where the votes are. I, unfortunately, I've written about this many times. It probably will take a fiscal crisis in the U.S. before entitlement spending is addressed. Uh, there's no will to do it now, and there will be even less will in 10 years when the share of people getting Social Security and Medi Medicare is even higher than this today. Um, I'm told we have time for one more question. Arguably, there have been two industrial revolutions. British Revolution, where you took manufacturing out of the cottage, and because you were able to harness power, you could then bring it into a building. Uh, the second industrial revolution was when, in the United States, we introduced the assembly line. Uh, there's an article in The Economist this week, a very uh, detailed uh, survey on the next industrial revolution that we are in the throes of at the moment where, given a combination of new materials, new technologies, uh, in effect, we are going towards mass-produced, customized material uh, that basically allows anybody to work anywhere and produce anything. Uh, economies of scale are going to go away. Um, I'm wondering whether anyone has done any work looking at those two previous industrial revolutions as to the implications they had, the interaction between those changes and demographic patterns, um, and whether there's anything that you could then take and apply that to the industrial revolution that we're going under now. Because what I've been hearing was sort of predicated upon the assumption that we're in a 1950s type industry uh, environment, which is clearly not going to be the case over the next 20, 30 years. Well, I, I have looked at that, <laughs> and it turns out there's no answers from history, because the first industrial revolution essentially moved people out of agriculture into manufacturing, and it resulted in a huge increase in population, because workers were able to form families more readily and support children more readily than farmers, who basically tried to match the number of kids they had to the land available. The second industrial revolution uh, essentially moved people out of labor-intensive manufacturing into higher-skilled service work because the manufacturing was increasingly automated, computer-driven, and there was a huge opportunity for people to do creative design work on computers and through information work. Um, that led to a decline in fertility, essentially, because uh, knowledge workers had fewer kids. They focused on living uh, high-consuming urban lifestyles. So it had completely the opposite effect. Now, this third industrial revolution, uh, which may involve uh, clean energy and greater amounts and on-the-spot manufacturing, we don't know what that will do because we don't know what the next stage is beyond manufacturing services. It may be that we have more and more people in small-scale custom shops addressing local needs, uh, but it may also be a, a smaller number of designers and people who are in control of the raw materials that are used for manufacturing, that have Rio Tintos and such in the world, control a bigger and bigger part of the economic pie. So we may lose that middle class that came from the widespread manufacturing and service jobs. Uh, I think it's too early to tell that the historical patterns don't guide us because the new one's going to be different. Um, thank you. Uh, Peter, Jack, a very interesting insight. We appreciate your time. Uh, thank you very much.